everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hot La Mode. And today on Hot La Mode, we are going to be talking about the TV show and Netflix production that you have all been asking for me to talk about for weeks now, which is Next in Fashion. But before we get any further into the video, if you guys are looking for a channel that talks about fashion in the most fun, sassy, bitchy, analytical way, this is it, you can go down below, hit the subscribe button and turn on my post notifications. I mean like, what do you have to lose? You're already here. And if you guys wanna see more from me, you can follow me on any of my social medias linked down below. And I also have a fashion podcast where I talk about the fashion news and gossip you need to know called the Fashion Victims Podcast. So go check it out. So let's get into Next in Fashion. I'm gonna be talking about the show, my thoughts about the judges, contestants, just the whole idea and premise of it, and some of the looks from the final collections of the two finalists as well. I do just want to say this video is filled with spoilers in order for me to actually review and discuss the show and my thoughts on it. So you have been warned. If you haven't watched the show, and you continue to watch, that's on you. That's your problem. That's a you issue. So let's get into it. Reality fashion design competition shows are nothing new, seeing as Project Runway, which is a famed show, is on its 18th season. But in 2020, there are some new contenders in the genre. Today, we're gonna to be discussing, as I mentioned earlier, my thoughts on the next in fashion TV show produced by Netflix. We eventually will get into Making the Cut, which is an Amazon produced show hosted by Tim Gunn and Heidi Klum, the former hosts of Project Runway. But that show doesn't actually air until March 27th, so you'll have to wait till then for my review. But getting back into Next in Fashion, the show has the same premise as Project Runway. So it's literally designers from all over the world have come to compete in timed fashion design challenges revolving around cultural and historical fashion themes. Yeah, you understand, you know these things. The completed or sometimes uncompleted designs are then judged by a panel of judges. And each week a duo of designers are eliminated based on their work which is quite different than Project Runway, which has a much longer runtime. The winner of the competition will be awarded $250,000 and be able to retail their brand on net a -Porte, a luxury e-commerce giant who stocks some pretty chic brands like Prada, Loewe, and Alexander McQueen, just to name a few. In reality, it's quite a big opportunity. A big part of my issue with the show stems from who they've chosen as the judges. Yeah, let's get into that situation. It's the most glaring of them all. There is a mainstay duo of judges who are Alexa Chung and Tan France. Alexa Chung is actually quite enjoyable to me personally, as she's been working in the fashion industry for quite a while, and she's an it girl. It girl. She's been on the cover of British Vogue, I think a number of times, and is a fixture of fashion show front rows. I also think that she's funny and charming and makes fashion more accessible for the everyday person, which is always gonna score some more brownie points for me personally. I mean, that British Vogue series that she did literally cemented my love for her. But the other half of the duo, which is Queer Eyes Tan France, adds a lot less to the mix in my humble opinion. A fashion competition show needs someone who actually actually is an expert on design and construction in order to have a real basis on which the critiques can stand on. Now I know I sound like an absolute moron saying that as Hot Limote is based on my critiques, but listen, Netflix is not cutting my checks. So if Alexa Chung is the Heidi Klum of this show, as in she has experienced wearing women's clothes, specifically luxury ready to wear and haute couture, Tan France is a very poor person's Tim Gunn, as in a mentor and sort of design expert that we're meant to trust. And to be totally honest, Tan France doesn't seem to know shit about design, which is blatantly obvious. From what I've read, he's been a designer at Zara and has worked at Chanel, but besides that, I don't really know what else he's actually done. And also, if you're a designer at Zara, that means you're copying other people's work, so what would you know about being the next in fashion. You cannot go from being an obscure men's fashion blogger on Instagram to dressing straight people in the middle of America for a television show to understanding the construction of garments, the complexity of fabric choices, or the obscure references of designers from all around the world. That is just not a logical fashion trajectory, and it's cheap casting in my opinion, as we want someone with knowledge explaining why a look is or isn't great. 
not someone that taught Billy Bob Jenkins how to French tuck and made it a somewhat believable styling choice because he has a British accent. That's the only authority the man has. And let's also be real with ourselves. Tan only got the job because Netflix has a hit with Queer Eye, which Tan is the fashion expert. Now, I cannot drag someone for calling themselves a fashion expert, but again, I am not cashing checks from Netflix nor getting upwards of a six-figure salary for the show. In reality, it's a very hard stretch to imagine Tan France giving an actual fashion designer any criticism because, well, he styled Pete Davidson and random people in small town America. I just don't think that necessarily makes you a fashion expert. I will say together, Tan and Alexa aren't terribly enjoyable. They're just kind of cringy. I didn't really love their chemistry. The selection of guest judges also was a bit different. I understand many designers with actually successful businesses probably don't have the time or the need to go on the show, but having designers like Dao Yi Chow and Maxwell Osborne, whose business public school has pretty much dried up at this point, shouldn't be judging who the next in fashion will be because, well, they don't know anything about what's next in fashion, hence their business plummeting. You know what I mean? But I have to say it was nice to see some actual industry professionals like Christopher Kane, Adriana Lima, Josephine Aberg, Philip Lim, as well as Tommy Hilfiger on the show. Th that was cute. I'm about that. But also, Project Runway has had some pretty good guests themselves, so they're not really like beating anybody out in terms of guest judges. Jason Bolden, who also starred in his own reality television show produced by Netflix called Styling Hollywood, also guest judged for multiple episodes. And it proves my point that Netflix likes to keep it in the family. I'm not saying they do incest, but like, if you have the talent there, they're gonna use it. All in all, for a first season, it wasn't a terrible roster of judges, but at the same time, it could be much stronger. But in order to do that, the show will have to make stronger ties with industry giants like LVMH, Kering, and Richemont. We should also discuss how the show actually runs. Essentially, every week the designers are given a theme and are meant to interpret that theme in a way that channels the theme, but also their own design codes and DNA. There was a range of themes from your standard red carpet to development of textiles in the print and pattern challenge, and even a bit of a more niche and technical skill during the underwear challenge, which personally I actually really liked. I have to say I applaud the range of topics they addressed and had the designers actually explore because the same themes can get quite boring. Although it was interesting to not see an unconventional materials challenge. One thing that was quite lost on me was that while they chose great themes, the way they explained those themes was pretty much non-existent. Let's take the rock episode, for example. I need to know the origins of rock, the designers that inspired the movement, and some key elements of the subculture besides safety pins and leather. If you actually explain that to the viewer, they actually would have a stronger understanding of the designer's choices. And isn't that the whole point of the show? To explain why the designers are doing what they're doing because we're trying to create a comprehensive understanding of fashion. Also, I think we should totally replace the airtime for Tan and Alexa's fashion tips and tricks. Cause by God, I would rather kill myself than sit through Tan or Alexa giving me style advice on a fashion competition show. This is not Queer Eye. I didn't ask. I didn't ask for your style advice. That's why I would watch Queer Eye if I was desperate for some random people to give me fashion advice I don't really care about. But I'm not watching Queer Eye. I'm watching a fashion competition show. It's just not what I asked for. Firstly, I'd rather watch the designers give me advice pulling from their own knowledge of running businesses and actually having technical skills, or I'd just rather them give more time to understanding the theme. Listen, I'm pretty well versed in the history of fashion through the decades, through subcultures, through styles, up to a certain point, but for the everyday Joe Schmo or depressed Debbie, they don't know shit. So you have to help them along, otherwise it's lost on them. All in all, I'm actually quite happy with the way they've structured the episodes, but it could definitely use a little work. Moving on, let's talk about the designers. I actually found that there were very few that I did not enjoy. Shows like Project Runway have always typecast the fashion industry as quite snarky and bitchy, which, I mean, it is, that's, you know, hello, hi, how are ya? But it also does have a side that really loves and appreciates the beauty and craftsmanship of the designers involved in it. 
Netflix did a really great job of fostering an atmosphere that felt supportive of designers and didn't make them overly dramatized or ridiculous. I mean, listen, there were some moments where you were like, oh Jesus, but at the same time, I think you understand through this show that it's really difficult to actually do these things. It's not just, you know, cut a piece of fabric and slap it together with some glue. Like, it's difficult to actually create clothing and to come up with constant ideas to then execute into clothing. To me, it showed a mainstream audience that this industry is not just gumdrops and rainbows and that it involves a lot of hard work and sleepless nights. And as somebody that is friends with fashion designers and knows quite a few, it's a very difficult job and I don't think they get enough credit. I also like that the designers were from all over the world, not just America. American fashion has really fallen on its face for a plethora of reasons. And as social media and other countries' economies have grown, a new group of global designers have emerged. So it was great to see a multitude of designers from countries like China, South Korea, Scotland, England, Italy, Canada, India, Mexico, Puerto Rico, and Pakistan. It was really cool. I have to say, I was very impressed. But I also think let's run through the designers and give you a little bit of my thoughts and opinions on them. Cause I mean, listen, you all wanna know what I actually think about the Goyles. So the designers started in teams and the first pair eliminated was Isaac and Shelly. Isaac seemed like he had his head in the clouds and essentially it was a streetwear designer who had no technical skills whatsoever, but ran some brand where he screen printed shit on a t-shirt and then said, oh, I'm a fashion designer. like. Sweetie, no. While Nichelle actually seemed like she was quite a good seamstress, the look that they sent out was quite blah and felt very Project Runway, which might have actually worked on Project Runway. Except the designers on the show are pretty much all very skilled, which kind of set the bar very high. Next was Lorena and Naresh, who were eliminated during a print challenge, which was sad and strange because that had been Naresh's specialty. I do want to give a little bit of a tidbit here. The show also alludes to designers having specialties, which I thought was quite a good idea as it allows the designers to have the codes of their brand and the aesthetic and DNA of their brand, which, you know, isn't really talked about on other fashion design competition shows, sort of shine. Normally their specialties, whether it be underwear or leather work or tailoring, would be on display for a more mainstream audience and it would actually be tailored into the episode. So for Naresh, who was famous in India for his print work, you know, they really put a spotlight on him to say, okay, like Naresh is big into this. Let's talk about it. Let's get into his business. So it actually sort of bolstered the designers on a more mainstream and global stage. Naresh and Lorena really didn't push themselves creatively in that challenge they were eliminated on though. And when a competition show allows you to make your own prints during a print challenge, that's usually something you should do. Like, I wanted to see where Naresh and Lorena were gonna go, but at the same time, like when they tell you to do something, you do said thing that they tell you to do. You know what I mean? Then there was Julian and Haley, whose team dynamic became their storyline, and it was the most tense part of the show for me. While teams do suck, the fashion industry is incredibly team oriented as the process of making a garment has quite a lot of steps, and even more steps when you start to want to market and sell those garments. While the cow print look wasn't my absolute favorite, it really was not that bad. And the look that they sent them home with was quite boring. And unfortunately for Haley, it was the one that she had taken creative direction on. So it got quite messy there, which is actually something I also feel like we should talk about. These shows are very important to these designers because in reality, it's still a reality competition show. Although Netflix did a very good job of making it quite positive and happy, this is still people's livelihoods and their businesses that they're putting out there. I actually did a really cool interview with Darnell for the Fashion Victims podcast with Daniel W. Fletcher. And we really discussed how he was kind of terrified to go on the show because what if he was the most skilled designer? What would that do to his brand and his brand's image? So in reality, this show is very much so imperative to a person's business. So 
anybody wants to like give anybody hate during this experience, like don't, cause that's not cute. Not everybody is perfect when they're under a lot of pressure with cameras in their face 24 seven. Don't, don't be giving hate to the gals, okay? Then there was Farai and Kiki who actually had a really promising storyline. Kiki Peterson is a streetwear icon and has really helped to pioneer the women's wear side of brands like FUBU, Rockaware, and Apple Bottom Jeans, just to name a few. To me, Farai sort of fell to the wayside and we really never got to understand her vision and design aesthetic. And in a quite dramatic episode for a show that is mostly about positivity, Kirby Jean Raymond, founder and designer of Pierre Moss, came on to judge the episode dubbed Streetwear and caused a cliffhanging ending to the episode. The thing is, on one hand, this was Farai and Kiki's third time in the bottom during the show, which usually is grounds for removal. But at the same time, streetwear is something that the show shouldn't have really tried to have white or non-black people of color trying to judge. While yes, Alexa and Tan can judge the looks of Kiki and Farai, it doesn't mean that they have the cultural context or nuance to understand their work revolving around streetwear. So when it came time to have the contestants be eliminated, Kirby Jean Raymond stood up for Kiki and Farai and noted that he thought their pieces were strong enough for them to remain in the competition. Personally, I disagree with Kirby having watched the show. They just didn't have that spark yet. But it was really great to hear Farai voice her frustrations with not only the process of the show, but also her frustration with the industry and the way that the luxury brands appropriate black designers work and culture and then disregard it when it's convenient for them and when it's no longer beneficial for them. It's something that needs to be addressed in the fashion industry and I'm happy to see it being brought to the world's attention by a black woman. A decision wasn't made during the fourth episode as to who should go home. So Farai and Kiki remained until the fifth episode which was the underwear challenge. Tan did have an emotional moment at the beginning of the fifth episode, which was a bit annoying as he called himself and Alexa designers. First off, buddy, you're not anywhere near a designer. I'm sorry, I understand maybe you worked for Zara. Cutting patterns and copying people's mood boards off Instagram does not make you a designer. And I personally also would not classify Alexa as a designer necessarily, although she does run her own brand. So at least she has some real inkling of what goes on into running a design label. Farai and Kiki were eliminated because of their ill-fitting silk shorts and their lack of an underwire in their bra. Another hint for those going on these kinds of shows, if the theme calls for a bit of technical skill you may not possess, do your best to make it happen, Otherwise you will most likely be penalized for it. I'm sorry, like you, if you're doing a bra challenge, put a goddamn underwire in there because you know Tan France is gonna go, well, there was no underwire. And who wants that? Then there was Claire and Adolfo who had been steadily trucking along the whole season, but when it came to their rock runway, it definitely read more Matrix. Personally, I like their looks better than Minju and Angel's, but the competition at this point had been getting really tight and Minju and Angel had been quite big favorites early on. Then from this episode on, the teams were split, meaning the designers now had to fend for themselves. Although, two designers still would be eliminated at this point. Carly, who had been teamed up with Daniel, had been quite a volatile character on the show, but she had created some beautiful pieces with him, like that amazing camel suit and the boxers and bra combo. Angelo, who had been paired up with Charles, was the lovable bohemian with very little technical skill, so it wasn't shocking when he was eliminated for a less than perfect sportswear challenge. Then there was Charles, who had been an amazing technical designer who could execute amazing and beautiful creations, like his first black and pink look from the red carpet challenge. But his military look didn't exactly read military. And Marco, who I'd been rooting for all season, is actually quite well known for his fashion shows that have the cast of RuPaul's Drag Race walking in them. Throughout the whole competition, him and his partner Ashton had been labeled LA and costumey, but he and Ashton had delivered some really nice looks like that severe tailored suit and the underwear pieces, which are his signature. Personally, I think that if you're gonna do a show that is getting in a quite diverse range of designers, cause it really was diverse, not in terms of just geography, but also what kind of designers they were, you need to stop typecasting those designers as too LA or too costume because you invited them on the show. You invited them and casted them on the show because they were the way they were. 
So why would you then penalize them for that on the show? I personally was very sad to see Marco go. Then you had Angel and Ashton. Angel was one half of Dragon Princess, an iconic duo and had made some pretty chic pieces throughout the competition. Ashton had usually been lumped in with Marco as being too costumey as well, but at the same time, I think it was unfair to judge a heavily performance-based designer as being too costumey. Like he literally helped make Beyonce's iconic Super Bowl look. So like, why are you calling him costumey when he does like performance wear? The finale had two of the fan favorites from the very beginning, Minju and Daniel, compete by showing two 10 look collections. From my time watching Project Runway, I was kind of scared to see if the collections were going to be good. And I really was pleasantly surprised. The show had the designers create the collections in just a few days, which is totally different than the way Project Runway had the designers create their final collections. For one, I think Project Runway has the designers actually make the looks themselves in their hometowns. Whereas on the show, it was like done in the studio. The designers here seem to be provided with seamstresses and pattern cutters to help make the process be much less nerve wracking. Let's talk about Daniel first. Weirdly enough, I know him personally and we did the podcast. It's actually really good. You should totally listen to it. In reality, I actually really loved his collection. It was classic Daniel, which is quite chic tailored men's looks, which feel professional, but also modern. I also love that Daniel stuck to his roots by incorporating his British heritage into his pieces. He has always been a menswear designer, but his women's wear looks were quite frankly, very strong. The skirt over pants was hot and the finale dress was a silver masterpiece. I was, I was pleasantly surprised. As for Minju, her opening looks took my breath away. You could really tell that she had her own oversized silhouette but it wasn't baggy or overdone. She also had been asked time and time again to show that she could design sexy looks. And in this collection, she really proved that she could do it in her own way. While I didn't love every mixture of patterns, she really proved that she actually could mix them well. I think even the green dress that the judges didn't think was terribly strong had a beautiful neckline with an interesting panel of sheer and embroidery. And she had really proved that she could actually channel an independent style while also giving the judges semi what they want. Honestly, I didn't actually know who would win the show, so I was low key on the edge of my seat watching it. But when Minju won, I was actually quite happy. Both had demonstrated great stories and their house codes throughout the entirety of the competition. So it didn't really feel like two collections from designers I didn't know. I like knew their design aesthetic. I knew what they were doing. I knew that this was gonna be a culmination of all their work from the show. And that felt quite good. It felt like it was designers I could actually root for. All in all, the show wasn't that bad. It definitely needs a few tweaks here and there, but it feels like something a new generation of kids in fashion could actually look up to. There are designers with their own businesses and this show could eventually help make said designers household names. I'm excited for a season two if there is one and Netflix if you're gonna do it, call me. So those are all my thoughts on Next in Fashion. I really enjoyed it. I really hope that you guys did too. I'd love to know all of your thoughts in the comments down below and I'd love to know who you thought should have won. Should it have been Daniel? Should it have been Minju? Like what, who were you feeling? Who did you, who were you rooting for from the very beginning? So again, thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you guys on the next video and TTYL.